It's appropriate that uh, Haas would sing regarding prayer because our subject this morning is about prayer. And I have wanted to begin this new year with this emphasis upon prayer. And so last Sunday morning we looked uh, especially at the theme, Why Pray? And next Sunday morning we will look at the theme of unanswered prayer. And today I want to address the subject, How to Pray Every Day. St. Paul, writing in Colossians 4.2, says, devote yourselves to prayer. And the word devote, obviously, you recognize as a strong term. It's to give yourself intensely to. My mother went to be with the Lord six years ago. She passed away at the age of 81. Some time shortly before her death, I was talking with her, and I was about 38 at the time. And uh, Mother made an indelible mark on my life for many reasons, one of which was her habit of prayer. She could always be found praying in the early morning hours. And uh, I said to her, Mother, has there ever been a day in my life when you have not prayed for me? I don't know why that just came upon me one day to ask her that, but, and I would hate to think if my kids came to me and asked me that question, all right? So there's some, been some days I've missed, but I knew my mother with her habit of prayer couldn't have missed much, and I wanted to know how much she had missed. She sort of rolled her eyes for a minute, and quizzically, as she would do with her face when she was thinking, she mulled it over in her mind a little bit, sort of like researching all that was in there, and said, well, Son, she said, I think I may have missed two or three days. Not bad for 38 years. So if there's anything good in me, you know, just chalk it up to my mother's prayers. She did that for me and for, the, for my brother and sister. And she left a special treasure because she prayed. And she prayed every day. And I, and I don't know a single Christian that doesn't want to be a person who prays. I know that all of us have struggles with the discipline of prayer, but I really haven't talked with any Christian who doesn't want to become a better prayer and be more faithful at prayer. And so my message today is directed with that in mind, not to overcome any resistance on your part, but to simply say there's some really foundational and fundamental things to do to enable us to have a privileged time of personal prayer each day of our life. Two things that I can summarize this message with. One is to have a set time and place to pray. Put it on your calendar. Put it on your agenda. Praying is a lot like giving to the Lord's work. If you say, well, I'm going to do everything else first, and if I have anything left over for the Lord's work, I'll give it, you will find that it will almost be impossible for you to ever make any meaningful contribution of your finances to the Lord's work. It has to get up high, the highest top on the agenda. And same way with prayer. If we take the, the hours of our day, they'll come and go, and, and suddenly we'll have ended the day and find that we're tired, and we go to bed at night, and we haven't had time to pray. Isn't it wonderful that there are all the calendaring techniques now for us that are out? There's, uh, the psychologists, I think, call it living with intentionality. Isn't that a marvelous word? But it says, I choose not to let life flow by me without directing the stream of its activities and its minutes and hours. I choose to live with intention. And daytimers' calendars have helped so many people make their list every day of what's on top and what needs to be done. And you'll never have a really if, uh, effective and continuing personal life of prayer unless you have it as a stated purpose. A goal every day of my life is to pray, to pray at least so many minutes. And you'll find that with that, you will be helped by a regular place of prayer. Whether it's by your bedside or you clean out a space in your closet or you have a separate room or you take a walk through the park and you have a place there where you stop and pray, but intend, make an intention, a goal to pray. And that time of prayer, if you don't have a regular discipline of prayer, I would suggest to you that your time of prayer at the beginning will not be very long and don't try to make it real long. 
because you'll wear yourself out at the beginning of the discipline and not be any good for the long haul. So start with something realistic. I suggested that last week. I was remembering this week an incident that happened when I was 17 years of age. It reminded me how important it is that we uh, do disciplines on a modest scale rather than trying to bite off more than we could chew. And also reminding me of the principle that unless you are using something, you're losing the facility to, to use it. I, I had enrolled as a freshman at Evangel College, and I was, since I was preparing for the ministry, it was popular in my student era that if a, somebody were going into the ministry, they find a way to go out in gospel groups on the weekend. So I wanted to get into a gospel group that would go out and minister in churches. And I unfortunately cannot hold a part in singing, and most all the gospel groups were in those days quartets, which right away dates me, you know, as the four electric guitars and drums and all these things which the saints would have been very perturbed with. And all we had was the human voice and a piano. So I, I wanted to sing, but I can only hold melody. And the, the option left to me was the piano. The problem was I didn't know how to play the piano. But I said to myself, smart 17-year-old brilliant freshman that I was in college, I said, oh, learning the piano should be no problem at all. I'll just sign up and take a course in piano, and within six months I should be able to qualify to be the pianist for one of the gospel groups. I envisioned myself as one of the great pianists of the day. My favorite quartet at that time was the Blackwood Brothers Quartet, and I liked their pianist, Jackie Marshall. I said, I will give Jackie Marshall within six months a run for his money. And when I, take, when I show up for the piano course, the teacher insulted me by giving me a Claire Thompson beginning piano lesson book for six-year-olds with nursery rhymes. And that was beneath my dignity almost to practice with. But I started, and then to add insult to injury, I found that I could not coordinate the notes with my fingers with my feet on the pedals, it grew to be very frustrating. And I quickly found out that in six months, I was not going to be Jackie Marshall. I would be lucky if I could play Mary Had a Little Lamb. I struggled through that course. It's probably no course I've ever had. At the end of the semester, I said to the professor, what grade am I going to get in this class? He said, George, I'm going to be very gracious to you and give you a C minus. I said to him, Mr. Ellingwood, I have um, gotten good grades in all my other classes, and I know this class is only worth one credit hour, but it's going to prevent me from getting on the dean's list if you give me a C minus. I need a better grade than that. He said it would be not fair to other students to give you a better grade. He said, what do you think you need, however, in this class? I said, I need an A in this class. <laughs> he said, I could never do that. I said, it would be a shame to keep a person like, like me off the dean's list just because of a practical course like this that I didn't do well in. He said, well, I suppose I could give you a B minus. I said, would that help? I said, well, it'll help, but it's not quite enough, you see. I need just a little bit more. I said, how about an A minus? That would give me the dean's list. If you give me an A minus. He said, I could not give you an A minus. I said, oh, please give me an A minus. This is now the insight of higher education, all right? He said to me, if you promise never to take piano again, I'll give you an A minus. <laughs> I made the promise. And uh, today I don't know as much about the piano as I knew that one semester I had it because I haven't used it all these years. I don't know the key of G from H on the piano, all right? And the only thing I know now how to play on the piano is Rock of Ages with two fingers and that not well. I'll miss a few notes on that because what I had has been taken from me because I didn't use it. And prayer is the same way. The only way to continue in an effective prayer life is to pray. And if you're not praying, what will happen in your life is you'll lose the ability to pray. And the only way you'll get the ability to back, back is to start praying. And how do you uh, learn to do what the Apostle Paul said, to pray without ceasing? Well, you begin by praying somewhere, and you gradually expand your time so that your soul becomes capable of more and more prayer. It's not an automatic thing we just turn on. I find as I look at the Gospels and the book of Acts that Jesus and the apostles had regular times for prayer. Mark chapter 1 gives us a typical day in the life of our Lord, beginning with his ministry in the synagogue, then going home for lunch where he heals 
Peter's mother-in-law, and then at night everybody gathers around the house and he heals them. And after that typical day, the Gospel of Mark says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And that does not seem to be atypical. That's rather typical of Jesus' ministry. He would get up early in the morning or Matthew 14, 23, after a busy day in which he had fed the 5,000, he sent the disciples away across the lake and then he sent the crowds away. And after he had dismissed them, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. And he was praying. In John 18, too, when he's down in Jerusalem, not in Galilee, he evidently also had a place and a time to pray there because Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, that is Gethsemane, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. Jesus had this time and place to pray, and his usual time of prayer was either early in the morning or late in the evening. The apostles appear to pick this up because Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says that they devoted themselves to prayer, among other things. Prayer is what they gave themselves to. And Acts 3, 1 says to us that Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And Acts 10, 9, at noontime, Peter personally was going up on top of the roof in this little Palestinian flat to pray. He was keeping now a midday time of prayer. Um, what intrigued me about Jesus' prayer life is that the disciples knew when and where he was praying. And I, that I really discovered brand new this week. Isn't it great that you're not too old to learn new truths? But I, somehow I'd never seen that. My idea was of Jesus saying, go into the closet and pray, pray was that you shouldn't let anybody know what you're doing. And they shouldn't even be aware that you're out there praying. Uh, Jesus evidently didn't mean that. He, he meant don't pray in posture like the Pharisees who like to impress people with their spirituality through their praying. Pray alone to the Lord, but people knew where he was. And I would submit to you that one of the most difficult things we have to do in family is to let other families know that we're praying, especially after we've had a family altercation of some sort or a marital argument. And, and let's say wife goes over to pray in her regular time and husband is thinking, how dare she, that hypocrite, after what she said to me, she's praying. You see, we sometimes feel threatened to let one another know we're praying. And yet what a beautiful discipline to have, a time and a place for prayer. And I would suggest if you do not have a regular time of prayer, that you either begin first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening or both. And that you let your early morning prayer help direct your day and you let your evening prayer help review the day. Uh, so find a place and a time to pray. That's very simple to say, and as you know, if you've ever done it and set out to do it, that's not as simple as it sounds. It means living with intentionality. And then the second thing that we need to do is to use a pattern of prayer. Um, now, now we don't specifically need to do that, but it's extremely helpful if we're not praying regularly and personally to have kind of an outline of, uh, of how to pray. And so a few weeks ago when we were in Luke chapter 11 and we're, we're getting back in a couple of weeks back to going through our journey through Luke, we've temporarily put that on hold, but I gave a little outline from the Lord's Prayer, C-H-R-I-S-T, C, concentrate, our Father, H, hallelujah, hallowed be thy name, R, rule, your kingdom rule in me, I, give me, I, this day, S, Savior, forgive me, and then T, triumph, lead me not, but deliver me. And that's one pattern of praying you can use. But since I preached that sermon just a few weeks ago, I just can't go back and preach that. So I'll give a second pattern today for prayer. Is that okay? And it's a prayer pattern that maybe you're familiar with and you've heard. And it's a little pattern that simply uses the word ACTS, A-C-T-S, and takes a different letter off of, uh, a word off of each of those letters. For example, A equals adoration. Begin your praying with adoration. Don't simply rush into God's presence and immediately, so to speak, tell him all you need, although God will respect you if you do that. It isn't that you've broken some rule. God says, oh, I didn't praise me first. Scratch all the requests, didn't hear you. Tape's not working. <laughs> now, God reads our hearts, but it's good. It's, uh, it's courteous, even, if you can use that term of God, to come and begin by adoring him in prayer. Jesus does this in the disciples' prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's the beginning of praise to the Lord. I look at the early church. Acts tells us how they began, and it says that 
that for 10 days they were meeting and they were praying together. And I got to thinking about that. What could the church have been praying about between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost? It doesn't appear that they had any specific agenda of what they were supposed to do. I think what they were doing in prayer mainly was praising. And they were just in prayer thanking the Lord for, thank you, Lord, for the leper we knew that you healed. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for rising from the dead. And it's obvious that when the day of Pentecost occurs and they're all filled with the Spirit, and they spill out into the temple courtyards and begin praising God with languages they haven't learned. What are, what are they saying? They are, they are telling through their praying in other languages of the mighty deeds of God, and they're giving Him praise. And that's perfectly natural. They've been doing that for 10 days. They, they weren't asking God, I don't think, for anything. They're just saying, wow, we're serving God who has revealed himself and Jesus Christ who is alone and unique in the whole earth of all the people who have ever lived. He alone has risen from the dead and we saw it with our own eyes. And their hearts had to be ecstatic. So I would suggest that every time we pray we take some moments to adore the Lord. And um, then we can move past that to a second letter in the word Acts which is confession. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you say, do I need to do this daily? Well, if you're human, I suspect that you do need to do it daily. Unless you're in a state of spiritual translation where you're like Enoch and you walk with God and are not for God took you. I don't know too many of us who can live through any particular day in our attitudes, in our words, and everything is so perfect that we don't need to come to the Lord in some way and say, Lord, in that area today, I need your forgiveness, and maybe I need somebody else's forgiveness as well. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray on a regular basis, forgive us our sins. When I was a kid growing up, I think, uh, I don't know if young boys are different today living in our hygienic American society, but as a kid growing up on the mission field in China and Tibet, I loved dirt. The, uh, everything was dirt. There were no paved roads. And in fact, the Tibetans among whom my parents ministered never washed from the day they were born until they died. They, they lived outdoors and it's cold weather nine months a year and you, you wash, you catch pneumonia. So, but it was their religion not to wash, not, what, not for hygienic reasons, although in, his, in, in the Creator's wisdom, he allowed them to have that belief, I think, to spare them all from dying of cold. But they greased themselves with yak butter. And you never wanted to get a Tibetan into a heated room. That, that just was unthinkable. But I thought my life, when I was a little kid in a mission field, the Tibetans are the neatest, smartest people in the world. So they never have to take a bath. And uh, my mother, though, would get me at least once a week for an ear cleaning. And oh my goodness, could she pound those ears with a washcloth and get into rivers and valleys in there that just hurt. It was like a Brillo pad taken to your ears. And you know, it's not nearly so hard to keep your ears clean if you do it on a daily basis. But when a little boy is playing out in the dirt all week long and his mother, and mother was just inspecting me thoroughly, although she always asked me every day, but the inspection was once a week. And it hurt a lot. And I think of that little incident when I think of confession of sins. Because if we go for periods of time in our life and we haven't confessed our sins, God has to use a Brillo pad in our life. And there's a lot of accumulated junk that has to be gotten off. But if we're confessing daily, it avoids a root of bitterness building up in our life. It avoids anger building up in our life. Um, and uh, we can get along a lot better with other people as well as with ourselves, not to mention our relationship with God. Scripture says, for example, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That means don't go to bed still angry with someone at night. Clear it. Get it out. Deal with it. Confession. Um, you know, I feel that the people that probably have the keenest sense of sin are not the rapists, the muggers, the thieves, and the murderers. They're people who are trying to do their best to live a righteous life. Like Isaiah, for example. He's one of the most righteous men, if not the most righteous man morally that you'll find in the Old Testament. But when he sees God high and lifted up, what's his response? Woe is me, for I am undone. He becomes exceedingly conscious that even the, the small things that are out of sorts in his life are very big when they're seen in the light of God's purity and holiness. It's just like a diamond ring, you know, in the daylight. It may look okay, but if you get it under the jeweler's instrument, you can see the flaws in it. 
And if we're measuring our life compared to someone else's, we often look okay. But when we get in prayer and begin to see God's holiness and what God would really like our life to be, we begin to see the flaws. So we need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know that flaw. Help me. Forgive me. And uh, confession is a marvelous way of bringing healing into our lives. The Lord's really kind of stopped me in my tracks this week. I was down in Mexicali. I'd been speaking some in, uh, in Imperial this week at a camp meeting. And uh, while in Mexicali, just visiting this large city on the border of a million people, much different than Tijuana, we're in a very nice district of, uh, of the town, and a beggar came up to us. And I, that was the only beggar I saw. But as he shuffled up to us, my instant reaction was, he, sh he looks healthy, he should be working for a living. And so I just walked off. And as I walked off, it was like the Lord touched my life. Not so much that I hadn't given him anything, but for my attitude. My haughty, superior, condemning, judgmental attitude. And when you're staying in touch with the Lord, it's wonderful to see how he corrects, corrects you as you go along. We need correction. And prayer and confession help us to plug in on that. I once flew with a pilot in a small plane. He got into the plane, turned the key, revved the motors, got him going, taxied down the runway, and took off. And he never went through a checklist. I was worried. Because I'm not the kind of person that likes to fly in a private plane. In fact, I've, I don't have the faith of John Huntley. I have three things go wrong when I fly in a private plane. I get acrophobia, which is fear of heights. I get claustrophobia, which is fear of being closed in. And I get seasick or motion sick. And when all those three come together, it's no fun. So I decided God has called John Huntley to be the pilot in our church, and I'll stay on the ground. Except big planes, I can somehow don't get quite the claustrophobia. So, uh, but this guy took off, and we're on our way from Springfield, Missouri to, I think it was Dayton, Ohio. And after several hours in the air, I looked down, and we're about 10,000 feet up in the air, and I said to him, I'm sitting in the back seat, boy, there sure are a lot of planes in the ground below us. Look at them at all levels, and look at all those planes sitting down there. We must be over some airport. Are we close to Dayton? He immediately got out his maps and started you know, doing like this. All of a sudden, the intercom or the radio began to crackle with some words from the control tower that I won't repeat. It turned out that he had drifted over the Cincinnati airport. And jets were trying to land or take off, and he was in flight paths, and it was just a mess. And his carelessness was a direct result of the fact that he hadn't even bothered to go through the checklist. I found out a few months later, by the way, that he crashed. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. Just the plane was ruined. Taught him a lesson. <laughs> we, uh, we need to check in. You know, there's a little checklist of prayer, adoration, confession. Keep our hearts clean. And then the third letter of that acronym, ACTS, is uh, Thanksgiving, where we... Uh, come to the Lord after praising him and after confessing and say thank you Lord for what you're doing in my life thank you for your goodness and your mercy when Jesus faced the cross the Bible tells us he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them Paul writing from a prison cell says to the Philippians don't be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God we need thanksgiving in our life my dad was a stickler for social amenities. And uh, several years ago, while dad was still living, he had given me a little gift. I think it was for my birthday, and he was aware that a couple of other relatives or friends, I'm not sure which, had given me gifts, and three or four weeks had gone by, and I had not sent a thank you note. Dad cornered me one day. didn't matter that I was pastor of Newport Mesa Christian Center. I'm still his kid. He says, George, I just want you to know that no matter how busy you are, you are not too busy to get yourself sat down and write a thank you note. You owe that to the people who were kind enough to give you something, and you need to learn some manners. <sighs> you know, I didn't like to hear that, and I bristled, but I knew right away Dad was right. If you're too busy to say thanks, you're too busy. And God wants us to have that attitude toward thanksgiving and prayer. You see, what happens in relationships, by the way, if, if you find that there's a person in your life whom you are not giving thanks for, either they're very distant to you and don't matter, or they're very close to you and are under your skin, and you don't really want to give thanks for them. Because that means you'd have to do some repenting, probably, over your relationships. And thanksgiving is a marvelous way also to bring healing into troubled relationships. Lord, I thank you for this 
thorn in the flesh. Because you're going to turn it into a rose or you're going to help me to be a better person as a result of it. So have you thanked God in your prayers? Have you thanked him for what he has done in your life? Do you thank him for each member of your family? Have you thanked him for your blessings? Have you thanked him for your trials? Not because they're pleasant, but because those trials are working good things in your life. Have you thanked the Lord for the body of Christ, the church? Thanksgiving. And then the last letter in Acts, A-C-T-S, is supplication, requests. And Jesus in John 17 shows us an excellent way to bring our requests. For after having begun with praising God and having no need for confession, Jesus then prays for himself, he prays for his own, and he prays for all of us who would come to know him. There's an ever-widening circle of concern in the, Lord, in the Lord's praying. So if we're praying in supplication, we might, for example, begin by saying, Lord, what do you want to change in me? So often my focus on praying has been, Lord, what do you want? Would you please change these circumstances? And the Lord is more fundamentally concerned, I believe, in prayer with changing us. And then past that, he has the freedom if he desires to change our circumstances. Shannon Gustafson, a member of our church, who wrote an article in our church newspaper several months ago, which is, a, I think, a real help. She organizes her praying into special prayer emphasis of supplication during the week. And I just share with this with you as one example, if you're not praying, how your prayer can be organized so it doesn't become routine or boring. She says, on Sunday, I pray for my church, pastors, staff, services, youth groups, women's ministries, missionaries, and other ministries. On Monday, I pray for marriages in difficulty. On Tuesday, I pray for personal friends and their families. On Wednesday, I pray for those who need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And those, these included the people she was witnessing to. Uh, and it's not that she didn't pray for them other days of the week, but just in that day, she concentrated on those requests. Thursday, I pray for those who need healing. Friday, I pray for my children's school, its teachers, staff, students, activities, the prayer chain of the church, our nation, leaders, and political issues. And Saturday, I pray, she says, for other ministries in which I have a personal interest. So the week goes along, and she's praying through a wide number of concerns. A lot of you do this, and maybe you have it organized differently. It doesn't matter how you organize it. Let the Lord lead you to organize your praying life, but let's come to him and ask. In the book of Acts, I went through it this week in looking at specific prayer requests. I found five specific prayer requests in the book of Acts, and all of them were given wonderful answers. They, the early church, Acts 1, prayed for a replacement for Judas. God answered. Stephen prayed for forgiveness for his enemy who had stoned him, and God saved Saul of Tarsus. Peter and John prayed in Acts 8.15 that the Samaritans would receive the gift of the Spirit, and they did. The early church prayed for Peter when he was in danger, Acts 12.5, and God gave them Peter back. And then in Acts 28.8, Paul prayed for a man who was ill, and God healed him. Let's have faith and persevere as we pray, knowing that the effectual prayer of a righteous person avails much with God. And then one thing that doesn't belong to the outline, ACTS, but one other thing that should be said is that each time of prayer also can be a time of listening. And we need to train ourselves in maybe meditation or simply being aware of what the Spirit may want to say back to us. Now, this doesn't mean God is going to speak to us audibly. I've never had God's voice speak to me audibly, but I have had in prayer many, many times the prompting of the Lord saying to me, George, have you considered this? Do this. And you will never learn how to obey the inner voice of God unless you, unless you do some practice and find out how he speaks to you in your prayer life. One of the most pronounced ways that God ever spoke to me was when I had, after I had first become pastor of the church and, and I got into a into a standoff with the board of elders, then the board of deacons. They wanted to do something one way and I wanted to do it the other way. And uh, I was 29 and had the world by the tail and I knew everything, which meant I knew better for what was best for the church. And I said to myself and to a few people that were close to me one day in a fit of pique and anger, if they don't change their mind, I'm gonna go straight over their head of the congregation. I'm gonna put it before the congregation. It's them or it's me. That's how young pastors get in a lot of trouble. They're hot-headed. And I felt the Lord say to me as I was praying about that four words. He didn't say them audibly, but they were powerful words. George, fast your tongue. Hmm. Didn't want to hear that. 
been much easier just to have a good old fight. But the Lord said, fast your tongue. And you'll find as you pray regularly that the Lord shares many things with you. Try this phone call. How about talking to this person today? Why don't you change your routine today and do this instead of this? Listening. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says. Well, there are so many other things that could be said about prayer. We can, for example, strengthen our prayer life by taking our Bible into our prayer life. And as we integrate our Bible reading with our praying, we can then let the passage which we have read that day speak to us and help us to pray. We can uh, review the past day and take it into our prayers and say, Lord, from this past day, what of it do you want me to pray concerning? Or we can take the coming day into our prayers. Or we can put our desires into our prayers. Or we can begin and develop a prayer notebook or journal, as many of you are doing, and pray out of it and keep track of how God is answering our prayers. But the important thing is that we launch out and pray. If you're not praying, begin faithfully to have a time to pray. R.G. Sproul has a little book called Effective Prayer. And I was especially intrigued by what was on the cover of it. It's a little paperback, and in color, as a picture, there is a, there is a portrait of a man praying. And there is a block of ice around him from about the waist on down. And it's obviously been melting. You can tell from the picture that the block of ice used to cover him completely. He was encased in ice. And the symbolism is that when he folded his hands and began to pray, the ice around him began to, to, to melt. And you can just envision that soon, as he keeps praying, all that ice that's still around him is going to go away. And there is such a thing in the spiritual life as coldness. And that coldness makes us insensitive to the Lord. It makes us insensitive to the Holy Spirit. And with it, it makes us insensitive to other people. And sometimes we wonder, well, where are our feelings toward God and toward people? And we need that restored through the warmth and meltdown of prayer. So let God warm your heart and your life through prayer. We will see God do great things in our lives and as a whole church family if we will give ourselves to prayer and devote ourselves to prayer. I'm praying that this year, in 1986, for our church will be unlike, absolutely unlike any year we've ever had and that we'll be able to look back as God visits this church this year and this community, by His Spirit, we'll be able to look back and say, it began as we all made a commitment to devote ourselves to prayer. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, we come to you as did the disciples because we hunger after you and uh, we want you to teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray and to be faithful in prayer. Help us, Lord, to not only know about you, but to have fellowship with you in your name. As your heads are bowed, I've really felt constrained to simply not preach and then let us all go out and not make some kind of response that we'll know we made a concrete, definite decision while we were in a service. And so I'd like to ask you a question. In a moment, when I ask for a show of hands, if you're willing to, for the next 30 days, establish a time and a place to pray for a set period every day, maybe five minutes. But if you're willing to do that, I'd like for you to raise your hand, not so that I'll see it, so I probably won't even look, but so that you'll know that you made a response to this message. And now many of you have that time of prayer every day. You never miss it. But raise your hand anyway. And there are others here who are just waiting for a chance to make a commitment and bring some intention and purpose into your daily schedule and say, Pastor, you hit it right on the head. I haven't been praying, and I so badly want to pray. I just really need to make that commitment to pray. I want to give you that chance to do it here in this service. And it's not forever and ever and ever, but for 30 days, because I'm convinced if you'll begin praying for 30 days and do it faithfully, you'll go on from there on your own. It'll kick you free into a whole new area of effectiveness in your life. So just for yourself and for God, how many would say with an upraised hand, Pastor, for the next 30 days, I'll have a time and a place regularly to pray. Could I just see your hand or show your hand to God? You don't need to show it to me. Good. Now, Lord, give everyone the strength to do this.
for it's the easiest thing is to make the commitment. And now, Lord, it comes living it out. But give the power of your spirit so that we can do it. Help us to pray and to be people through whom you work. In Christ's name, amen.